All right, guys, this is going to be the third week of our homeschool due to the coronavirus. It's the week of um, May 13th through the 19th. We're going to start a new thing. It's a fun chapter, I think, known as the Enlightenment. It looks a little fuzzy to me. Maybe it's because I'm so up close to it, but there we go. And the Enlightenment is going to be... Uh, something different. You're going to do your reading guide on the scientific revolution and the political ideas of the enlightenment here are going to come directly from the scientific revolution. Um, and it's the ideas of inventors like Copernicus and Galileo and Isaac Newton and they bring about a new way of looking at the physical world. They said if reason can be used to govern the physical world, if we can figure out interplanetary movement and the way that things work, then if we take that reason that we look at in the physical world and apply it to the understanding of natural laws, of why things happen, all right, natural laws are simply the things that govern the basics of human nature. Who is it that we are? Why do we do the things we do? And it stands to reason that if natural laws when applied to society, then we could solve the social, the economic, and the political turmoil of the day. The difference is, and we talked about the, um, the social classes in the Industrial Revolution, in rich and poor, why some have rights and some don't. If we can reason it out and think about it logically, right, like doing a Rubik's Cube puzzle, then we can find these answers. And so we're going to apply these laws to the human world, we're going to solve the issues of the day. And this brings up the two big, um, two of the big philosophers, Thomas Hobbes, who I like to say hog all of the power, and he's contrasted by a guy named John Locke, who wants to unlock the freedom. And both of these guys, uh, you know, were from the same era. They were living at the time that the Stuart dynasty, the guys who tried to become absolute in England were ruling. And the big question between Hobbes and Locke is what exactly is the role of government? What are we exactly trying to do here? And so during the Stuart dynasty, these two Enlightenment thinkers come up with completely opposite ideas of what was going on. Now Thomas Hobbes here has a very dark, nasty view, trying to be my weather person here. Um, of, of human nature. He writes a book known as Leviathan. And in it, Hobbes says that people are basically greedy. At our core, we're never satisfied. We always want more. We are greedy and we are selfish. And therefore, we need a strong government to control us, to tell us what to do, how to do it, and when to be there. And so, he says, Thomas Hobbes does, that people exist in his book Leviathan in a state of nature that is poor, it is nasty, it is brutish, and it is very short. You're going to be born poor, you're going to live a hard life, you're going to have to work brutally hard, and then you are going to die. And so he says that there has to be something of a social contract here where people living in a society would willingly give up some of their freedoms, they would give up this state of nature to exist in an organized society where there are laws, where there are rules. The best way to organize this society, according to Thomas Hobbes, was necessary for the good of the entire society. So for Hobbes, the best government is an absolute monarch who makes the decisions and tells you what to do and when to do it. Because people are selfish, people are greedy, they're going to hoard more like toilet paper or hand sanitizer or whatever else it, it, it is going on, and they're not going to leave enough for anybody else. People just can't help it. It's who they are. Now, Hobbes, again, Thomas Hobbes wants to hog all the power in one person. He is contrasted by John Locke. 
And John Locke, I always say, wants to unlock all of these freedoms. And to Locke, he's got a different view than <clears throat> Thomas Hobbes. And he felt that people are basically good, people are good, and they are moral. Right, they're reasonable, you can talk to them, you can figure things out, and you can work out a solution to the problem. And Locke also felt that there were natural rights, but to him, those natural rights were the right to life. You have the right to live the life as you choose, the right to liberty, you have the right to make your own choices, and the right to property. You have the right to own something. These are natural laws in which everybody is entitled to. And Locke's beliefs in, in the right to life, to liberty, and to property also combined with his idea that it is the government. Government should be founded specifically to protect these rights, these laws. That is their job. The best form of government is one that has limited power. Limited power over the people. Right? He did not like the idea of absolute monarchs. Life, liberty, property unlock the freedoms. According to Locke, a government has an obligation to its citizens. It is the government's job to make sure that its people have these basic rights. All right? And he goes even further. It's the government's obligation to protect them. If it doesn't, if the government does not respect a person's basic rights, then it is the people's right. Not only their right, but it is their responsibility to overthrow the government. If the government isn't protecting your, your right to life, liberty, and property, it is your responsibility to overthrow it. And this is the theme. This is going to bring us up to the revolutions that reverberate through across the world. We've done the transatlantic trade. All right? We've done the age of absolutism. All these monarchs have gotten crazy rich off of transatlantic trade. Now we're going to see the effect of their reigns. All right? According to Locke, the government has an obligation to its citizens. If a government does not live up to its obligations or respects a person's natural rights, then they should overthrow it. Now, following up John Locke is a French guy named the Baron de Montesquieu. Remember that he's got three names, Baron de Montesquieu. And in France, in the 1700s, we have the Baron. And he is, you know, across the ocean from the United States. He's across the English Channel from, from Hobbes and Locke. And the Baron de Montesquieu studied all forms of government, from the ancient world going back to the pharaohs of Egypt and, and then to Greek direct democracy and the ancient Roman Republic. And much like John Locke, Montesquieu does not like the idea of an absolute monarchy. And again, you know, we've got the reign of Louis XIV going on, and he just doesn't like the idea of absolutism. So he writes an essay known as The Spirit of the Laws. And this is the time when England and France cannot stand each other. And Montesquieu credits the system of government that they had created in England, which was a constitutional monarchy. Whoa, oh, my props are falling here. A constitutional monarchy. <clears throat> And he likes how the British implemented Parliament being supreme over the king. If you remember back to the English Bill of Rights. He considers, Montesquieu does, that there should be three branches of government. The executive branch, a leader to execute the laws. A legislative branch to create the laws. And a judicial branch to interpret the laws. Have three prongs of power, so there's checks and balances on each other. So Baron de Montesquieu, executive branch, legislative branch, and judicial branch. He has three parts to his name for the three branches of government. And next year in Civics and Economics, you guys are going to study the three branches of government. That way there's always a balance. Two against one. There's no two groups can cancel each other out. There is always a 
tiebreaker. He said, this is the best way to maintain a government. Now, Montesquieu's system, as I said, is used in the United States today, and we call it checks and balances. So, <clears throat> reading that is another French guy. His real name is Francis Marie Arrow. And that is his real name. He is a powerful French lord, so he creates a pen name known as Voltaire. And Voltaire is a lesson that everybody could, could you know, learn from in this day and age, in my opinion. Voltaire famously said <clears throat> that he lived to say what he thought. If he had a thought, he wanted to say. But you got to have a filter on, on, on what you say. And he was a very, very controversial figure in France uh, at the time. And he uses a very funny, a very clever use of comedy and fiction to kind of veal his thoughts, to express his opinions, and not get into a whole lot of, of trouble. And he writes a famous book known as Candide. And in Candide, Voltaire specifically denounced governmental corruption the so-called good old boy network. He did not like the practice of the slave trade. In fact, he hated the slave trade. And he did not like um, religious exclusivism. He did not like, you know, the French Protestants being kicked out. And his ideas not only upset the Roman Catholic Church, but also the French government and the king as well. So Voltaire gets exiled. And many of his books were burned, but this only encouraged him to keep on going. He believed in free speech so much that he defended it. He said, you know, I don't care what you do to punish me, and he was punished. I'm going to keep going. He said, but I will always defend to the death your right to state your opinion. He said, I may not agree with it. I may can't stand it, but I will defend to my death your right to say. He was dedicated to free speech. Again, he's not preaching to the choir. I may disagree with you. I may be a Republican. You may be a Democrat. I may be a Democrat. You may be a Republican. I may be a Socialist or a Libertarian. Doesn't matter who you are, what you think, your religion, your, your gender, your ethnic background, your political views, you should be allowed to express your views. Now, all goes back to Voltaire. But you got to do it peacefully, and you got to do it respectfully. He was a guy ahead of his time. He was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. People were out to get him. That's how passionately he believed in respectfully being able to state your um, opinion. So, here we have this old curmudgeon is definitely Thomas Hobbes. Here's John Locke, here is the <clears throat> Baron de Montesquieu, and over here is my man um, Voltaire. Really like, really like these guys. Well, three of them, Thomas Hobbes, whatever. So, anyway, now we're going to keep on going, and we're going to talk about some other guys. First one is a guy named Dennis Diderot. In Diderot, I say it, Dennis Diddy Wright, all right, because he wrote a lot. Diderot will publish 28 a 28-volume set of encyclopedias. Like your parents, when we were kids, we had to do a book report. We had A, B, C, D. We had a big encyclopedia we pulled off the, off the bookshelf. Um, Diderot punishes, punishes, publishes this set of encyclopedias. And in them, he prints the works of all political philosophers. What anybody was thinking, from Thomas Hobbes to Voltaire to Montesquieu to John Locke, he put it all in there. And Diderot said that his goal was to change the way people thought about government. I'm going to present you all of the information, you look at it, and then you make your own decision. But now, you have access to everything to help you make your choice. And so, Diderot's encyclopedias will challenge the divine right theory where kings are in charge because God wants them to be. And he said, he challenges the divine right of, of absolute monarchs, and as a result, the French government will accuse Diderot of eroding the morals of the people of France. Just like Voltaire, 
the Pope threatened to excommunicate him and anybody caught reading Diderot's encyclopedias. But the printing press had caught on. And despite the efforts to stop people from reading Diderot's encyclopedias, 20,000 copies were printed. People about they learned about the ideas of the Enlightenment, not only in Europe, but across the sea in the Americas as well, where we're going to see the revolutions begin. And after Diderot is another French guy with three names, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Rousseau might make a, a few of you guys um, you know, a little angry here, um, but um, Rousseau, or my examples might, um, Rousseau felt like Locke, that, that people are at heart basically good. Right? And he said, the problem is it is society that is constantly um, corrupting people. People are born good, but they fall into the trap of, like whether it's social media or one of those idiot Kardashians or TikTok videos or people watching a movie about you know, people covering their eyes and trying to navigate their houses and their little kids and running, running in, into walls. It is society. They keep up with the Joneses to have nicer clothes, better shoes, nicer cars, nicer phones, nicer jewelry. You know, you get caught up in the rat race. So people are corrupted by, you're sensitized from ads and marketing from all, you're like, ah, that's why I don't have a, a, a cell phone. So in 1762, Rousseau writes his own version of the social contract. And he said that men are born free, right? simply born free. And it was society that was constantly making the people change them from good to bad. Rousseau felt that society controlled the way people were shaped and behaved. And so for Rousseau, all right, some social controls are necessary. We got to have some sort of laws, all right? And it said people who consent to live under a government, if you choose to live here in this government, that the people, a consenting government, should be run by the one that the, pe the, one the people choose. So if you vote and you elect leaders and you vote for laws, you should agree to live under them. Some forms of social controls are necessary. A consenting form of government, one that the people choose themselves, was necessary for the common good. Otherwise, chaos would reign. People would surrender their rights when governed in a system that was based on their consent. They would retain their freedoms because the government was chosen based on the will of the majority of the people. He said common good should win out. Now, no one's ever going to be 100% satisfied. You can't get it perfect, but what you can do is get it as close as you can. And he said the common good should win out. But unlike John Locke, Rousseau felt that one should aim for the good of the community rather than the good of the individual. And this is where Rousseau loses me a, a little bit. Rousseau felt kind of like, you know, Plato back in, if you remember when we were talking about his perfect government, Rousseau felt that you should give yourself over for the good of the community. So if, oh, let's see, uh, Mariana here wants to be... Um, a dentist. And we all know Adrian said several times that she wants to be um, a nurse, but instead the government says, oh, well, sorry, Mariana, I know you want to be a dentist, but we need um, oh, a chef. And Adrian, I know you want to be a nurse, but we need someone to drive a recycling truck. That's what you have to do. All right, Mariana, um, becomes a chef, and Adrian drives a recycling truck. Doesn't matter if they want to do it, that's what the community needs. John Locke is saying, no, Mariana, if you want to be a chef, the government's job should help you. It should give you a path to help you attain that goal. Adrian, you want to be a nurse, here is a path 
to attain that goal. We can't do it for you, but we will help you, we will support you, and we will allow you to make that choice to get educated, to get training, whatever it is that you want to do. The government's job should help you do that. Rousseau is like, no, 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 no. You will do what the government role assigns you. So big difference there. I'm more of a lock guy than I am a, a Rousseau guy. Hope you guys don't mind me using you as examples here. Kind of, it's nice to pretend that we're still back in, in, in class. So um, the problem here is that to many people, the free and equal ideas of the Enlightenment did not apply to women. Many people felt that women did not have any of these natural rights. And even if they did, they were much more limited and in scope to what men were, were doing. But in the 1750s, a small number of women began to argue against this idea. The most famous is a lady named Mary Wall Stonecraft from England. And she protested that women had been left out of the social contract. She felt a woman should first and foremost be a good mother to her children, but a woman should also be able to think for herself and not be solely dependent upon her husband to go out and earn money. And she wrote a thing called The Vindication of the Rights of a Woman, in which she claimed that the same education that was given to men should be given to women as well, because education is a part of freedom and independence. So what we have going on, guys, is a political revolution, new changes in thoughts going on from men towards women. Keeping in mind the ideas of Adam Smith and laissez-faire and the Industrial Revolution and Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx. And what's going to happen between a 50-year period from 1776 to 1824, there's going to be revolutions that will reshape the world. They're going to start in the United States and they're going to twist over the Atlantic Ocean and go to France and then boomerang back and affect the Caribbean and the island of Haiti, South America, and Mexico. So it's the revolution boomerang. The two big two are going to start in the United States and then France and over to Haiti. We're going to go down to South America and Mexico. And it's going to start when we get to France because the French and Indian War between Great Britain and France left King Louis XVI bankrupt. And France was prosperous, but could not adequately collect taxes. And the people are keenly aware of Locke and Hobbes and Montesquieu and Diderot and Rousseau and Voltaire. And so revolutions are going to pop out and it's going to change the world forever. Okay, this is a quick one today, guys. Hopefully we had a chance to meet yesterday on our Google Meet Hangout on uh, the 13th or 14th. Keep me posted. Let me know what you guys need, and hope to see you guys soon.